Did you know that when St. Therese of the Infant Jesus was a child, she became entangled with some dangerous spiritual defects, which are also quite common nowadays. Yes, she was nearly lost. These defects not only endangered her salvation, but also had very damaging consequences for her own health. Join me as we find out how St. Therese overcame these defects and was miraculously cured in body, mind, and soul. And besides, we shall learn from the little flower herself how to overcome these defects, which can have fatal consequences. At the time of her death, St. Therese Lisieux in 1897, no one would have suspected that barely 27 years later, the life and heroic virtues of this unknown young cloistered Carmelite nun will be held up to the whole world as an example of sanctity. In fact, St. Pius X called St. Therese the greatest modern-day saint. What were the early years of the saint's life like? Marie-Françoise Therese Martin was born on the 2nd of January, 1873, at Alecon, France. She was the last of nine children of a pious French couple. In fact, her parents, having the distinction of being the first married couple to be, have been canonized as saints, Saints Louis and Zélie Martin. Her beloved father, Louis, was a watchmaker, and her dear mother, Zélie, ran a small lace-making business from her home. Both the Martin parents, at a young age, felt a strong calling for the religious life. But this had been denied to them by the respective religious superiors. Why? Because God had other plans for them. So they were married, and in their place, God accepted five of their daughters as religious. As I said earlier, there were nine children. Four of them had died in infancy or at an early age. Louis and Zélie brought up their family in a warm, loving, and very religious atmosphere. Although her mother described Therese as a charming child, she also stated, quite frankly, that her daughter was at times a little imp, who threw frightful tantrums and banged her head against their wooden bed. In 1876, the family received the shocking news that their strong and beloved mother was dying of cancer. Courageously, she prepared her two eldest daughters to take her place. And in the presence of her husband and her two older daughters, Zélie passed into eternity after receiving the last rites. And this happened when Therese was only four years old. This painful loss initiated in Therese's life a 10-year 10 10-year 10 period of shyness, oversensitiveness, and many, many tears. Little Therese tried over and over to master herself, but her struggles seemed to be in vain. When her dear mother was alive and well, little Therese shocked her once by telling her that she wanted her mother to die. Now, you can imagine Zélie was upset and shaken and asked her why she desired such a horrible thing. Therese replied with all simplicity and innocence that she was such a wonderful mother that she wanted her mother to go to heaven. And to go to heaven, she had to die. But when her mother actually died, Therese was devastated and her personality changed completely. From being a lively, extroverted child, she now became self-conscious, oversensitive, and crying when anyone looked at her. In spite of all the love and affection lavished upon her by her father, and in addition to having four elder sisters to mother over her, she could not come to terms with the separation from her mother. Though Therese loved her other sisters, it was her sister Pauline whom she chose to replace her mother. Pauline was a sister who taught her 
scolded her, comforted her when she was ill, and in general loved her as a second mother. Pauline prepared Therese for her first confession by emphasizing love and gratitude instead of sin or guilt. And Therese later wrote that she left the confessional happy and lighthearted. Since little Therese took her mother's death very hardly, badly, the heartbroken Louis sold his business and retired with his children to a place in the countryside near his brother-in-law's home in Lisieux. Now this family would help with the practical aspects of raising the five Martin girls. The 54-year-old Louis and his youngest daughter, his little queen, grew close, spending a great deal of time together. They would go fishing, exploring the countryside in the town, and they would often walk down to the nearby Carmelite convent to visit the chapel. On the first day of her second year in school, Therese's second mother, Pauline, entered the Order of Carmel. This new separation was too much for her weakened constitution, and she suffered a type of nervous breakdown. She was confined to bed for three months, where she experienced chills, fevers, convulsions, and even hallucinations, and a great deal of crying. Therese had become too attached to Pauline, and this was the second instance she showed her extreme sentimental nature, which affected her health gravely. In spite of Pauline's letters full of love and encouragement, the illness continued for some time. Therese confessed to her in her autobiography, what fears the devil inspired? I was afraid of everything. My bed seemed to be surrounded by frightful cliffs. Nails in the wall took the terrifying appearance of long fingers, shriveled and blackened with fire, making me cry out in terror. Well, the devil knew the harm that would come to his kingdom by Pauline joining the Carmelites, which would in turn pave the way for the other Martin sisters to follow her holy example. And that is why he vented his wrath against little Therese. Now, Louis Martin was so concerned about Therese's almost hopeless case that he offered a novena of masses at the famous shrine of Our Lady of Victories in Rome to obtain the cure of his poor little queen. How touching was his faith and love. Yes, it needed a great miracle to restore Therese's health. And this was brought about by Our Lady of Victories herself. One day, Marie, who was sitting with Therese in the sick room, became so desperate over Therese's illness and hallucinations, especially after Therese failed to even recognize her. In fact, this is how St. Therese describes her own cure. Marie came in again and knelt in tears at the foot of my bed. Turning towards the statue of Our Lady, she entreated her with the fervor of a mother who begs for the life of her child and will not be refused. Leon and Céline joined her, and that cry of faith forced the gates of heaven. I too, finding no help on earth and nearly dead, with pain, turned to my heavenly mother, begging her from the bottom of my heart to have pity on me. Suddenly, the statue seemed to come to life and glow beautifully with a divine beauty that I shall never find words to describe. The expression on Our Lady's face was ineffably sweet, tender, and compassionate. But what touched me to the very depths of my soul was her gracious smile. Then all my pain vanished and two big tears started to roll down from my eyes and fell silently. They were indeed tears of unmixed heavenly joy. Our blessed lady has come to me. She has smiled at me. And it was true. The little flower had come to life again. A bright ray from this glorious sun had warmed and set it free forever from its cruel enemy. The dark winter is past, the rain is over and gone. The year after her illness, Therese prepared for her first communion. 
After the careful teaching of Marie, her preparation by studying the Catechism, reading and rereading Pauline's inspiring and love-filled letters, making hundreds of acts of virtue and aspirations, which was followed by a retreat for First Communicants. After all these detailed preparations, Therese received Jesus for the first time. It was a day of great grace. Therese said that she experienced the Eucharist as a fusion. It was a kiss of love. I felt that I was loved and I said, I love you and I give myself to you forever. What a moving description by St. Therese, which clearly shows that she received many mystical graces. However, after Therese had received this great grace during her First Holy Communion, the devil struck back hard, shattering Therese's short-lived bliss. Satan tormented Therese with scruples and self-doubt. It was so bad that St. Therese says that she was attacked by the terrible disease of scruples. She described her moral sufferings, which were worse than her phys physical sufferings, in these words. One must pass through this martyrdom to understand it well. It would be quite impossible for me to tell you that I suffered for nearly two years. All my thoughts and actions, even the simplest, were a source of trouble and anguish to me. Therese was treated as a sickly child and was, in fact, lonely and overly sensitive. Therese's scruples affected her health, and she had to quit school at the Benedictine Abbey, and a private tutor was obtained for her. May 31st, 1886 was an extremely decisive day for Therese because she consecrated herself to Our Lady in a special way by joining her sodality, which was called Children of Mary. And when Marie joined the Carmel in October of the same year, Therese would not share her scruples with her anymore. And so she turned towards heaven and started confiding her scruples to her four siblings who had died in their infancy or early childhood and whom she believed were already in heaven. The answer was not long in coming. St. Therese says, Soon my soul was flooded with the sweetest peace. I knew that I was loved, not only on earth, but also in heaven. And so, after this, St. Therese was cured of her problem of scruples. That Christmas, after midnight mass, Therese overheard her father remark with impatience that he was glad this would be the last year that he would have to fill Therese's Christmas stockings with gifts. Now, normally, if she would have heard this, she would burst out into tears. But on this night, she felt a new inner strength. So in order to make her father happy, she behaved as if the Christmas custom of putting gifts in their stockings gave a great deal of pleasure to her. And later on, she said, the work had, that I had been unable to do 10 years, for 10 years, was done by Jesus in one instant. She had experienced what she called her conversion. To her, it marked the return of the strength of soul which she had lost at the age of four and a half. Now, let me bring out my trusted magnifying glass for us to analyze how St. Therese could have lost her soul and what saved her. Now, sentiment is something which all human beings possess and which is something good and necessary. However, sentimentality is something bad. And in Therese's case, it made her cling too closely to human creatures instead of clinging to God. Given the fact that she was still a child, we can somewhat excuse her. Also, when she was young, she loved being the center of attention and to seek for love and affection, which fed her self-love and vanity. These defects could have had very disastrous consequences as 
she grew up if it had not been for the careful upbringing of her saintly parents. And St. Therese herself acknowledged in her autobiography that if it had not been for a special protection of God, she would have ended up leading a very wicked life. Let me now speak about the problem of scrupulousness. Normally speaking, people with a delicate conscience are prone to scruples. And what is surprising is that this problem with scruples can be even more dangerous than a laxity of morals and customs. That is because the scrupulous person is very harsh with himself or herself. Scrupulousness, generally speaking, is also a manifestation of self-love, where the person gets too entangled with themselves, involving an exaggerated sense of sin, instead of confiding in God. Scrupulousness, if not dealt with proper guidance from one's elders, a superior or a good confessor, can even lead to depression. The person may become taken up by a sort of self-destructive pride through the influence of the devil, where he considers himself as good for nothing, hopeless, a burden for others, and therefore concludes that his life is not worth living. In extreme cases, depression can even turn into despair of God's goodness and of one's eternal salvation, leading the person to suicide. Obviously, not all depression is caused by scruples or pride. But yet, in many cases, the devil will use these defects to introduce depression. And in the concrete case of, of St. Therese, the devil used the weapon of scruples against her to warp her judgment. And the resulting mental anguish had serious consequences for which it sapped her physical and moral strength, and which could have even likely led to a downward spiral like I just described. And so what saved Therese? The prayers and novena of masses at the Shrine of Our Lady of Victories that her father, Louis Martin, offered for her was very decisive in her first cure. Besides that, the devout care and desperate prayers of her enduring sisters Pauline, Marie, Leon, and Céline was also funda fundamental. But the one act that saved Saint Therese was her own desperate prayer before the statue of Our Lady, begging Mary to have mercy on her, which in turn led to her radical consecration to Our Lady. This completely changed the economy of grace for Therese. What followed next was a consequence of her abandonment to Our Lady when she was delivered of her scruples by having recourse to the intercession of her four siblings in heaven. And finally, our Lord Jesus Christ himself, in a signal grace to Therese on Christmas, rid her of her sentimentality for good. But it was this one act that brought these consequences. Coming back to the present, most people, including you and me, at some point in our life may have struggled with some kind of despair and scruples, which may have affected our health and even required medical attention. In fact, mental health issues have become all but too common nowadays. How should we deal with them? St. Therese and her saintly family have given us an excellent example by relying on God and Our Lady and by patiently and loving supporting their family members in their, their hour of need and even providing them with appropriate medical care if necessary. In fact, both St. Louis Martin towards the end of his life and St. Therese of Lisieux had struggled with mental health issues and became patrons of those suffering from similar health problems. So go ahead and pray to them when you are afflicted with moral scruples, nervous breakdowns, sentimentality, self-love, vanity, pride, etc. If you don't wish to succumb to these deadly problems. And I don't know about you, but it definitely sends a chill up my spine to think that one of the greatest modern day saints, like St. Saint Therese, might possibly have ended up in hell. 
if it could have happened to her, then what about you and me? We're about poor sinners. And that is why I would like to invite you to follow the admirable example of St. Therese by completely abandoning yourself into Our Lady's safe hands by consecrating yourself as slaves of love according to the most efficacious method of St. Louis de Montfort. So click on the link provided below and find out more and to already register for the next free online consecration course. I guarantee that this is one choice that will change your life forever and make you a great saint if you live out this consecration seriously and perseveringly. Let's now return to Lisieux in France. In 1887, a new period of Therese's life was now beginning. Therese read The Imitation of Christ and faithfully resolved to put into practice the virtues it spoke so highly of, especially detachment from earthly things. This and Therese's other spiritual readings encouraged in her a growing inner life. Her scruples and self-doubt put aside, she now grew taller in virtue and became more mature. Her love for Jesus, nourished by her daily sacrifices, grew daily. She knew God wanted her to spend her life for Him in the Carmel, and she was eager to love Him there forever. But what would her life be like when she finally entered the cloister? If you think it was a bed of roses, all consolations, you are sadly mistaken. Did you know that just one day before St. Therese can make her profession, the devil very kindly almost convinced her to abandon the convent if she thought she didn't have a vocation? Like a wolf that grabs the sheep by its throat to prevent it from calling out and attracting the shepherd's attention, the devil almost silenced the young lamb, Therese. Join me in the next episode from within the sacred and mysterious walls of Carmel to find out how St. Therese escaped from the jaws of the devil and to witness her joys and sufferings from a unique perspective, which only my trusted magnifying glass can give you. So until then, God bless and Salve Maria.